see what's going on. Man, you guys are like my favorite worship band, just so you know. Well, thank you. Um, I absolutely love uh, what you guys do. It's just been so rich. And I uh, love having you guys once a month. That's what we're doing right now. Once a month we're doing this. So our next one live will be December the 15th. If you guys can make it, that would be incredible. We'd love to have a band. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we're totally looking forward to, to what's going on there and looking forward to that. We are, just so you're kind of clear, we do this once a month right now. Uh, normally we're outside, kind of rain, messed everything up, so we're just stuck in the house and we're packed in here. But uh, on a regular basis, we'll be outside, fires like we were last, last uh, month and just enjoying everything that's going on. And then we do online only in between uh, where we continue this teaching, and that way, uh, what we're trying to do is create natural um, small groups, right? So you could just watch this in your home. I, I posted on Sunday uh, somewhere around 5-ish, uh, and then you can just watch anytime you want to. Watch any night of the week. Just get some people together and kind of talk and see what's going on. We're hoping that, that as we continue this process of trying something different, that this is how it'll take. So that's where we are. And, uh, man, we're I'm excited. We're in the middle of a series now called Five Tools God Uses to Shape Your Lives. And uh, what I want to do is give us a chance. We do this on a regular basis in, in our house. We believe that the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and really helps deep-seat it in our life. And so uh, whether you're used to praying or not, what I'd love for you to do is just quietly where you are, just ask the Spirit to speak to you tonight. I'm going to do the same. We're going to pray out loud, I will, and then we're going to just jump into some truth. So you go ahead and do that where you are. I'm doing it where I am, and then we'll jump into some truth. Father, we've gathered together tonight to uh, to sing praise to your name, to, to hear uh, from your word, to be encouraged by each other, to eat a meal, to celebrate and to fellowship one with another, and to, to do that which uh, Solomon says was a good thing, to eat and to drink and, and to be merry, for this is where we are in life under the sun. And so we celebrate the, the bounty that you've given us of food, and thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We ask now that you would allow your spirit to have his way in our life. Father, we submit that to you. I ask that those who, who are listening uh, in other places or who gather here, that, Father, you would have a, a way in their life, that you would encourage them through the truth that we find in your word. And so we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, here's what I know about you. Um, God is at work in your life. It's a truism, right? He's always up to something. And, and this is what I'm hoping that we have caught as we've walked through this series on the five tools that God uses, right? And so... It's not often. Some, I, mean, I think there's a lot of people who just think you can only find God in church or something. Except you got those that are out there going, I'll find him on the golf course or in the mountains or what. And, and the reality is that we do. But God uses a variety of tools. Uh, and these aren't written down in the scriptures somewhere. You're going to go and you're not going to find the five tools, you know. But it's, it's an observation that we make about what God does in our life. And for me, it's personal experience. I know that God is in the process of shaping me into that which pleases him. And, and, and then I find he finds value in, in, in using me like that. He doesn't have to, but I'm grateful that he did. And so what I want us to, in just a few time, minutes that we're, that we're really looking here, I just want to remind us of some things that we always say here, uh, that you were made for this day. That, that's important for you to understand. Acts 17, 26 has God appointed the exact times and places in which we live and the boundaries in which we find ourselves. I love talking with new people and letting them know and celebrating the fact that, man, I'm glad you're here, right? You were made for this day. So, uh, and it's a great day to be alive. It's different than, than past. Younger generations are going to experience things that we, that we old people ain't going to see. But, but you are. So you were made for this day. And, and it's important that you know that. And not only that, but this day was made for you. God is up to work in your life. And he's shaping you. Here's what, here's what we know. We know that all of us are a part of what we call the Imago Day. We are image bearers of God. Unlike any other of his creation, you and me bear the image of God. We we reason, we love, we have relationship, all of these things that are amazing. And so in that, 
even though we are that and very valuable in that sense, we have a sin problem. And so what we've learned is that is God is asking <laughs> us to belong to him. And so we trade our life. It's an exchange, right? The scripture says, what will a man exchange for his soul? And so I give up all that I am for all that he is and find salvation in Christ. At that moment, God, God put his spirit inside of you. And now there's a process of transforming us much like the caterpillar that turns into the butterfly, this is what he's doing with us. And so what I want you to see is it's a natural process that God does this with. And so this may be new things to some of you. We, we launched this looking at the story of Joseph, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just want to remind us of some things that, that, that God has a specific plan for you, and he is able to bring all resources to bear to make that happen. What he's interested in is a relationship with you so that then you can be uh, one of those who become ambassadors for him in this world. It's how he's chosen to operate. He wants us to trust him with our life. That's the whole goal. And that's the scary part because we are control freaks for the most part. And so what he's wanting to do is, is say, listen, I, I've got this. You tr do you trust me, right? And, and, and so what we see is, and we, we begin to see that, that if we learn to trust him, anxiety kind of goes away, which is a, epidemic in our society these days, uh, anxiety. And it doesn't have to be. The reality that there's a God at large and in charge helps relieve that anxiety. I think a lot of people had, have had opportunity for all sorts of anxiety, but, but when we begin to trust him, things come into focus. And so God's shaping us, just like he did Joseph. And I don't want to rehash that story. I do want to remind you, though, that Joseph was our, and you may not know the story of Joseph, but I'm going to just give you the real rundown, not as much. We had fun last time we did this. But, but Joseph was, had a dream, and God said, I'm going to get you here. What Joseph didn't know, what it, what it was going to take to get him there. It wasn't going to be an easy ride. There were going to be a lot of people, a lot of twists, a lot of turns, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of hills and valleys. And in every bit of that journey, just like yours and mine, right? I mean, all of us had certain plans and realized we got railroaded or sidetracked, right? Any of y'all been sidetracked by, by what you thought you were going to do and you end up doing something else, right? And so that, we look back and we go, well, that was kind of painful. There was a lot of ups and downs in my life. I, I promise you, I didn't enjoy. But when I look back on it, I realize, man, I'm in a really good place. God has taught me a lot. And so this is, this is what we learned in the story of Joseph. Now, the weeks in between, we began to talk about those tools. And so we, this is the third one that we'll talk about. Let me just remind you what the others were in case you missed some of those. What are the, what are the things God uses most in our life to shape us or people? relationships and people. And I think it's important that we expect that that's how God is going to operate in our life. I don't, if I, if I were to ask you the question, who are the people that God brought into your life that shaped you? You probably have somebody's name that comes to mind, right? There's somebody that you think, oh yeah, 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 right? <clears throat> I, I remember in my own life, there were several all the way through my life. Uh, but in, in particular, uh, my youth pastor, Rich Teeters, uh, who was, um, uh, he was a traffic guy uh, on the radio. Back back then, you only had AM radio. Didn't, there was no such thing as really FM. It was AM. We WSGN, WERC, right? He was of the WERC traffic copter, rich rider of the ERC traffic copter. And um, he it somehow ended up becoming our youth pastor. And, um, and so as I met him as a sophomore in high school, uh, he was probably one of the first person that I felt like saw me really as an adult and then and loved me and so he brought me into his world he and man I thought he was like the coolest guy in the world but he I mean he told me how to play tennis uh, he he we went uh, uh, dirt bike riding our, our dirt uh, in the in the dude he had a, a Volkswagen thing it was like an off-road weird looking thing and uh, and so we we would journey doing that. And he would ask me questions about life. Like, why are you asking me? I don't know anything. But he treated me like I did. And uh, he absolutely altered the whole course of my life. One, one guy chose to love me, spend time with me, uh, turn my heart toward, toward ministry. And, and I, I count it that way. And, there, and I've had so many different people in my life who have just come in by, by some, you would say, like happenstance, right? And, and, they, and they bring you in. Uh, T Tammy was, was, was that way. Um, man, I, 
when I was in high school, I was like, you know, my goal was just to, you know, conquer every woman that I could find. Not, not in any, you know, other way, just like date. Right. And, uh, I mean, I was going to stay pure, but I'm just saying, you know, we, that was kind of my goal. And so, and we do these group things in between and we had the, we had a really cool group. And one night, uh, one of the girls couldn't, couldn't come. And somebody said, well, I'll bring Tammy. I never met Tammy. Uh, but we go hang out that night and, um, I'm like, I like that Tammy. And, and so I remember telling my, my buddies, I said, I'm going to marry that girl. And they said, well, you don't even know her. I said, I don't have to. I'm going to marry that girl. I said, if you gave me the choice, now this won't make sense to a lot of you younger guys, but I said, if you gave me the choice between Farrah Fawcett, right? That was, that was the poster that every guy had in his room when I was growing up. If you were to give me the choice between Fair Fawcett or, or Tammy Harper, I'm choosing Tammy Harper. And they're like, man, you were crazy. Not because she wasn't pretty, just because that's what it was. Now, I've got to tell you that now I can tell you the journey of what it took because she was good for helping me knock a lot of arrogance out um, because I asked her to homecoming and we went. It was a good time. You know, not a great time. It was a good time. But, you know, I, I like the girl. I'm going to marry the girl. So we may as well start getting to know each other. But I was still like, you know, hanging out with other chicks as well. And so when I invited her to the prom with me, which I mean, I'm like, why would you not want to go with me? I'm, I'm, I'm Randy. You know, her exact words were, I think someone else is going to ask me. I, I, I think I just got turned down. And I've never, at that point, I'm like, I don't even know what that feels like, but what do you mean? What do you, I'm here. You see me right here. And you're telling me that you think someone else is going to ask you out? And so that made me mad. And so then I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquest this whole thing. And so I began to chase her. And she, would, she gave me the we're too good of friends to date thing. And so I'm in this friend zone. And so literally, however weird this is, I would go out on a date. I would finish that date and I'd go hang out at her house because I really, really loved this girl, but we were too good friends today. And so it wasn't too long before I gave her an ultimatum. I can't do this thing. We either have to date or I, well, I can't be friends. I, I just can't do it. So at that point, her mom and dad came to my rescue and said, what are you thinking? You should hang out with this guy. Now, I tell you all that because it was a chance encounter at a high school that was so huge, it would be hard to have found people like that. But God brought that one woman into my life because of all the people that have shaped my life. This is, I'm not saying this because she's sitting here. I'm just telling you, that woman there has shaped me to be the man that God has called me to be. And so he used her in my life to do that. Very important that we see these things. These things don't happen by, by, circumstance, by happenstance. I believe, and I do tons of weddings. I, I love to do a wedding because I'm going to tell the story of how you met. And I'm going to remind everybody that in a sea of 8 billion people, God began to maneuver, maybe when you were a very young age, to get you to the right town, to meet the right person, to get to where you're going to be so that at some point you guys join together. Now, you may not believe in those kind of things, but I believe a sovereign God is intimately desirous of putting me with the person that he knows is best for me. I believe it's true of you. I want you to know this, and I want you to be open to the fact that God uses people to shape your life. Um, and, and so that was what we looked at. I, I ain't got to the real message. Yeah, that was what we looked at the first week. I, I'm getting there. I'm just trying to let you know. Now, the second thing that he uses uh, is circumstances, right? How many of y'all have had like this crazy circumstance that happened and it threw you for a loop? Maybe it was a new job. Maybe it was the loss of, of a, a mom or a dad. Maybe it was a divorce. It, it could, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that happen, right? We looked at those things. An illness can do that to you, right? I, I think I mentioned to some of you that when Tammy was diagnosed with cancer just this year, it was like, what? You know, because that's a word you don't, you don't expect to hear. But it, it caused some sobriety in our life for a minute, an opportunity to, to ask some questions, right? Because I'm of the opinion that if, if that's in our life, I want to know what's the worst case, what's the best case, and what do we do, Right? And so we began to have these open, honest conversations with each other. Like, what if this doesn't go the way we want it to go? You know, I, I, I think my world will turn gray, but I think I'll be all right. Right. Uh, because I can't imagine life without her. Now, she would have been better off. She would have been in heaven. She didn't have to deal with me anymore. Right. I mean, so you got those. There's trade offs. But but that it, it changed us in some sense. Um, and there and, and so I can think of a lot of t turns in my life where. Difficult circumstances did that to us. Uh, we found ourselves in a situation because of some poor business decisions that I made where we had to file bankruptcy. That's an embarrassing thing to do. You know, I'm telling you guys things, you know, maybe you don't want to know, but that, that, that changed us too because, you know, you end up getting things wrapped into your world and then realize it's about to be ripped apart, so you think. And I remember going to the federal courthouse and 
she and I feel like, you know, just, you know, little paupers and, and low lives and what do you, you can't handle your money, you know, and, and you go in the courthouse and you tell them this is what I've got and this is all there is. And they sign some papers and they stamp a deal and you got to go to some sort of class and then you're, you're done. And we walked out. And I remember standing right outside that federal courthouse and Tammy looks at me and she goes, we're still standing. Right. And I thought, you know what she is? I was embarrassed. I, and I felt like, what a terrible leader I am. The reality is, that's a part of a law that the, that the Lord has given us, the year of Jubilee, where he does allow for every seven years debt to be. That's why you can only file bankruptcy every seven years. It's a biblical principle. Somebody may not know that. But the reality is of what happened to, to us was it sobered us up in so many things. And uh, today... It's crazy because, I mean, I've got like our credits in the 800s. You know, you think you'd never overcome those things. But but we did. And, and, and I watched God turn our life around. And it was totally him who did that. And so I'm, I'm telling you these things because I think it's important that we understand that. I've got friends who have addictions. And that circumstance of wanting to get out of that or becoming exposed changed their life. I've got a guy that I work with. We're close friends. Um, but he had fallen heavy into addiction uh, alcohol. And he got caught at work uh, doing that. And so it wrecked his life. And so we sent him through rehab. And he came out on the other side. And he'll tell you his story. His, his, everything's better because he decided to, to follow through with just going to recovery and, 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 and removing those things. And so, I, I don't again, I don't want to labor the point. I just want you to understand God uses all sorts of things. And we looked at Scripture last Sunday night uh, while we were doing the online thing. And so, just understand that. God, expect that when a circumstance comes, breathe. Right? Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. Right? Uh, and God is able to... Uh, to uh, all, work all things out for the good to those who love God, right? God's able to do that. You can't mess your life up so bad that God can't go watch me fix it, right? You can't. It can look like shambles to you, but God is still able to work. Now, I never saw my mom and dad needlepoint, and my mom needlepoint, I never saw any of that, but I, I did have a friend who, whose grandmother did that, and he said, I remember as a kid sitting, you know, you know what needlepoint is, where they got that little ring, you know, and they got the cloth, and they stick these... From the underside, all you see are these strings dangling down. And my friend used to say, man, it was the weirdest thing. I'm like, what is grandma doing with all these strings everywhere? He said, until she let me see from the top side what was going on, and it made all the difference. All of a sudden, I saw this incredible, beautiful picture, right? And I think sometimes we all we see is from our vantage point, we look at our life, and it just looks like these strings hanging, and nothing, nothing makes sense. Nothing's cohesive. But from God's side, he's working all things out. And so you and I need to know that, and we should expect this. I want this to be encouraging to you. I want you to understand, there, you're, you're, not, you're not on the sidelines. There is no second string in the kingdom of God. God means to use you. And so all I'm trying to do is encourage us to know that just like Joseph, listen, you're no better or less than Joseph. All the people in the Bible were as whacked out as we are, right? They just God just happened to use them. And he used people, and he used circumstances to bring them into life. The third thing is what we're going to look at today in the quick time that we have left really is the fact that he uses what we would call just basic biblical teaching, right? And, and listen, you don't even have to go to church to do that. You, you, you can be hit over the head with the scripture, so to speak, at any <laughs> random thing. I, I've got friends, man, that, that uh, you know, just they're bored one night and they started watching TV and popped up some TV preacher. And, and the, with the words coming through there were exactly what they needed. I, I've had that happen to me. I remember I used to get in trouble all the time because I didn't preach like everybody else. I tried to pre I tried to be in that box, you know, because I really wanted to do well when I was in college. And, and so, you know, I, I did win the Expositor of the Year Award my senior year when I was preaching. If that means anything to you, it's not, I'm, just, just, I'm just telling you. I knew how to do that, but it felt like strained on me. And my, pa my, my professors always said, Randy, if you'll ever quit trying to preach like somebody else and just do your thing, you might actually be able to do something. Well, I just didn't know how because I was trained that way. And I remember turning TV on one night. And I listened to a guy named T.D. Jakes. I don't, I don't know what anybody thinks about him. It doesn't matter at this point. I'm going to tell you, I heard him say, he was telling the story of David. And he said, he was talking about David. Remember the story where David wanted to go fight Goliath and so Saul gives him all that armor? And he's like, man, it don't fit. He's a little kid with all this armor. And he goes, I, I, can I just use my own stuff, right? And and uh, and 
T.D. Jake said, some of you out there are trying to put on somebody else's armor, but if you'll just pick up your sling and sling your sling the way God wants you to sling your sling, God's going to do something with you. It was like it was like a moment in my life where I'm hearing that, and I'm like, I felt like freedom, right? It was just a little biblical truth that just floated through, and, and you know, from people, somebody that a lot of people, you know, believe is like a heretic. But I'm telling you, I heard the word, and it, and it began to get into my life. You can get it in a thousand different ways. I mean, even around down the road, listening to a song that just popped up, and all of a sudden you go, "There's Jesus in that song," right? This is this is what I want you to understand. Everything that's happening in our life, you have to see that God's hand is in that. This is this is a game. If you don't see it, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna play a lesser role in your own story, which is your own life. The creator of the universe is weaving into your life through people and through circumstances and through the word. Powerful truth. Let me give you, let me give you a text. Uh, uh, and you, you probably know it. We, you might even start having a song in your head. It's because it's about a wise man built his house upon the... Okay, let's, let me read it to you. Act like you've never heard it before. Let me just tell it to you. There, this is what Jesus says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine hears these words of mine, and acts on them, will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell, and, and great was its fall. Now, in that little story, I don't know if you caught it, there's only, there's only two things that are different in that story about each of those individuals, right? The flood came, the rains, the storms, all of that. All that's the same, right? Just because just cause we're Christians doesn't mean that storms don't come in our life. Have you figured that out yet, right? And, and so it doesn't matter, but here's what does matter. The foundation of which you build your life on matters. And he says, the one who hears these words and the little caveat that was different was and acts on them. Do you see, when you hear the word, if you just say, I'm going to act on that. You have no idea that the life that will change because you make that one choice. So the Word of God is always coming at us. Sometimes you're just reading it back. Have you ever done that? You just pick up the Bible, flip it open, and start looking for something? Uh, I had a friend of mine, Jacob Damkani. He was uh, in Israel. He was a Jew. He is a Jew. Completed Jew now. Uh, and he was wondering if there was a Messiah and began to cry out. He said, literally, uh, he said, the window was cracked open. He said, the wind blew. And it flew, and my Bible flew to a page in Zechariah. And he said, I read it and for the first time. It was like the first time I'd ever seen it. And he said, I knew that, that, that Jesus was the Messiah, right? And so these are things that happen. And so here's what I would encourage you to do. If you want God to shape your life, you ought to open up the book and, and just begin to read it. it. It will make a difference in your life. I could tell you story after story, and I probably will tell you some. But it's about putting them into practice. <coughs> Tammy's dad um, didn't grow up in church. T in fact, Tammy's mom didn't grow up in church. Um, but, but Tammy's mom, as a little girl, decided she was going to walk uh, down to um, at 66th Street Baptist Church. And uh, she began to go to church as a young girl. And uh, when they got married, uh, Robert wasn't going to church, Tammy's dad. But, but she, he was a policeman. She would fix him breakfast every morning, except for Sunday. Sunday, she'd sit a box of cereal out and go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to church. You're on your own. You can go with me, or you can have the cereal. He says, I got tired of eating cereal and decided I'd go to church. He went to church. He heard the gospel. Changed his life. He heard one little principle. that This is the one that he kept teaching me my whole life. And it was the principle of, of tithe. And I'm not... I'm not preaching that today I'm not I'm not even talking about that. I'm saying his understanding was if you take if you don't hoard what God has given to you but you give a tenth back God will always give you back over and above now it's a simple principle and a lot of people have abused that prosperity principle but I'm telling you Robert Harper did not abuse that principle but he became a generous man and over the course of his life as a policeman we watched and were amazed at his death the amount of money that he had amassed from a little salary that there's no way that that could have happened. There's only one way a man had that kind of money on a salary like a policeman. Either he was a thief, which he wasn't, <laughs> or, or he had trusted God and God had actually honored the word. And I'm just telling you, 
it, it, it happens. You've got to start somewhere and just do the word, right? Marriage is the same way. You have to start somewhere. I have to start somewhere to decide. And, and I've talked about these things when we do. I, the reason why I'm talking about weddings, I've done three in the past four weeks. It's like, so I'm like this wedding machine. But one of the things I tell all the couples is, I listen, hey, marriage is hard. You need help. And so I'll look at the man and I'll say, hey, you, you know what the word requires of you? That you would sacrifice yourself for her. That you would love her uh, with all you've got. That you would cherish her. That's the word God uses. That you would, um, that she should be more holy because she's around you because that's what Jesus did. And I quote Ephesians and then I look at Peter and I say, you know what else she says? He says, you need to live with your wife in an understanding way. And I always say, now that's, that's not fair because even women don't understand their own life. And somehow I've got to be forced to do that. And then I'll look at the women and I say, you know, what, you know what God requires of you? That you would be his strength. That you would be, because he needs that. And that's who God's given you to be. That's what help me in the book of Genesis means. That you would be his strength. Uh, it's used really in terms of God giving us his strength. But he uses it of the bride giving the husband strength. And that's a little secret you women may not know. But we men have a weakness. And you feel it. And so when you realize and start looking, when you play the role of strength, and, my, and I realize that's what she is to me, it's a game changer. And so we just had to start practicing those things. She would respect me and trust me no matter how crazy my dreams got. And I'm a crazy guy. And she would freak out. And she would call my mom and go, you know, you can't believe what he's talking about doing now. You know, and, and, and then they learned together that, it, listen, he's so ADD, he'll move that. He'll, if you don't say anything, he'll change that from that dream to another one and it won't matter. And, but but here's, here's what I've realized. The fact that we practice some simple principles of the scriptures is the reason why our marriage is where it is. Because we practiced it. You can't just hear it. You have to apply it, right? It's the same way with forgiveness. Listen, if you would just forgive, it's a scary statement that Jesus makes. If you won't forgive your brother from the heart, then neither will I forgive you. I, I was in a conversation the other day with a guy. I don't know. I can't do that. I can't forgive my mom. All right. Your life, it's going to be your life that's going to be ruined. It won't be hers. I guarantee you, your mom's not thinking about you right now. You're letting, you're becoming a prisoner to your own forgiveness, and you're drinking poison expecting the other person to die. You don't forgive for them. You forgive for you because God's forgiven you. You have to forgive. If you would apply that one thing, you cannot imagine the freedom that you would have. And so these are the things I just think, man, if we would just open up the Bible, read it, it's crazy good. And the principles in it are life-changing. And this is what I want to just kind of hang out with you and share tonight. And I could, I, I could talk too long, and I'm trying not to. I just want us to understand some of these aspects of things, right? Like, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will guard your heart beyond anything you could imagine. It, it burdens me to see people just anxious. I'm like, you don't have to be. We, we cry out to the King of Kings. You know what happens when you cry out to the King of Kings if you read your Bible and you know it? I get it from Daniel. Daniel began to pray because he had some questions that he was asking. And, he, and I'm talking about serious prayer. And when he... When he finished praying, he said, stood before him was the angel, the archangel, who said, when you first uttered your prayer, God sent me. <clears throat> if I could paraphrase it, he would say, but it's hell out there. Now, what I mean is, he said, I had to fight through the Prince of Persia and everything else just to get here. But, but what do we know from that? When, when you begin to pray, God began to get the angels to begin to minister to us. You, if you see yourself praying that way, it's a game changer. And so I'm, I'm going to pray that way. Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together. I believe that. I believe God takes everything in my life and it makes a deficit and turns it to an asset. People say, well, how come you never stress out about things? Because I know things. I know that God is able to take a deficit and turn it into an asset in my life. And so I'm going to rock with it. I, you can't make me mad because I'm, I'm good. Whatever deficit comes my way, I believe and I'm acting on the truth. That, that God will take that deficit and turn it into an asset. I believe what Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. If I just focus on taking care of you, God will take care of me, and I got no worries. These are truths, and I don't want to overstate them to you. I just think you need to know that. I think you need to know that the blood of his son constantly cleanses you from all sin. I'm going to leave you with these. I, I'm sorry, I, I turned into preacher mode pretty quick. I'm trying not to. But 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of his son constantly cleanses you from all sin. <coughs> You know what that means? That means you're always forgiven. Always forgiven. God is never 
in a moment where he's not forgi- un- he's he's not forgiving you. He always is. It's constantly there. That's a game changer in your mind because you think that God's got these. That we, there's a scale up there, and oh man, I screwed up three times, so now I got to go pay penance or I got to go do something else. No, you don't. He's already forgiven you for that sin. He's cast you out of the depth of the sea, and he doesn't remember it anymore. That's a powerful truth. You know that God is always at peace with you, and you will never not be at peace with God because it never was about you. You were at war with God, and God brought you near. And when you accepted Christ, those of you who did, then you're at peace with Him because of the righteousness of Christ. Do you know that? You will never. God is never going to be mad at you. He's never going to be at war with you. He only has one thing. He wants to shape your life, which is why we're talking about these things here. I will tell you this, that every regret you have and will have, and the goal is to get to the end without regrets. I don't know if you know that or not, but that's what you want to do. I I worked as a geriatric psychiatrist for several years uh, as a therapist for them, and I saw people at the end of life, and their regrets were weighing on them, and I, I knew then I didn't want to do that. Do you know what every regret happens to come from? Not doing what the Word says. You, you Rarely will you regret. I never regret doing what the Word says. But you will always regret not doing what it says. And so I just want to share that with you today. Thanks for coming by and hanging out with us. And so, uh, and you guys, got, we got to sing. Come on, I, we, we can end the night. I'll just tell everybody, hey, good night. Sorry you weren't here. And we'll just sing all night. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Y'all come on up. I'm going to pray. And then we're just going to worship our way out of here. Thank you, Father, for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that you are shaping our life. Would you just be gracious to us, Father, and and make that plain to us this week. May you give us and overwhelm us with your word so that we would see the value of it. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.